Many Brits across the UK are saddened by the lack of large animals across our landscapes. As I've covered many times before on this channel, most of Britain's large animals were lost to extinction, mainly through overhunting and through habitat loss. In recent years we've been reintroducing native species, such as beavers and European bison. It's exciting to see these animals thrive in the UK once again, but the UK is also home to plenty of non-native creatures. There have been plenty of zoo escapes and released pets over the years, and some of these creatures have been able to survive here. In this video I'll be going through just a few of these animals, as I'll be going through five non-native species that thrive in the UK. And for our first species, we'll be heading to the woodlands and shrublands of Australia, as we have the red-necked wallaby. Wallabies are some of the cutest marsupials on this planet, but they are often confused with kangaroos. Of course, these creatures are closely related, but kangaroos tend to be a little larger and are better suited to open areas. Wallabies have smaller legs compared to their bodies, and this helps them to be more agile when moving across forest floors and also more rocky areas. The red-necked wallaby is the largest wallaby native to Australia and can reach lengths of almost a metre. They get to this size feeding on vegetable matter, usually in the form of grasses, roots and weeds. As well as being found on the Australian mainland, this wallaby also has a subspecies that can be found on Tasmania. This subspecies is known as Bennett's wallaby and is slightly smaller than its mainland relatives. But how did a marsupial living on the other side of the planet make its way to the UK? Well, the short answer is through zoos. As they look very similar to kangaroos yet are a little smaller, they're a perfect choice choice for zoos with less space. In fact, their love of life in captivity is one of the reasons why they can be found in the wild in the UK today. During the mid-1900s, the wallaby population at Dublin Zoo was growing out of control. The zoo was unable to find other zoos that were willing to take them on, and understandably they were unwilling to euthanise them. This is where the Bering family came into the picture, as they owned a small island off the coast of Ireland, called Lambay Island. They introduced these wallabies to the island over a 30 year period, and these animals have since thrived here. By 2016 there are thought to be around 50 individuals, but this island isn't the only place where these wallabies can be found. There are many escaped red-necked wallabies on the Isle of Man, and there's also a very small number of palmer wallabies. These wallabies are a little rarer than the red-necked wallabies, and are also much smaller. A population in the Peak District was thought to go extinct in 2009, yet there are plenty of other sightings across the UK. There have been 95 confirmed sightings between 2000 2008 and 2018, and most of these sightings are across the south of England. This area has a much milder climate, which would understandably benefit these wallabies. As these wallabies are relatively large non-native creatures, they could have a negative effect on the ecosystem. There hasn't been much research on this topic, but as they still have relatively small numbers, their impact isn't very noticeable. It's thought that they could affect hare and rabbit numbers by competing with them for food, and they could have an effect on agriculture as they like to feed on root vegetables. But for now, I think many Brits are happy to see the these wallabies in the UK. But for our next species, we'll be heading to Southern Europe and Northwest Africa, as we have the European yellow-tailed scorpion. Now, if you were to imagine the perfect habitat for a scorpion, it's safe to say that you wouldn't imagine an old town in the UK. You'd be right in thinking this, as they're normally found in rocky areas, usually in warm, temperate climates. Although some scorpions can haunt you in your nightmares, this scorpion is more cute than deadly. Adults only measure around 4.5 centimeters long, and although they are venomous, their sting is less painful than a beast. Sting. There is one basic way to figure out if a scorpion has a deadly sting or not. Generally, if they have big pinches, they usually have a weak sting, and if they have small pinches, they usually have a very powerful sting. This is because if they have small pinches, they are more likely to use their tail to kill, and this of course can also work the other way around. These tiny scorpions are ambush predators, and lie motionless at the edge of their layers, before quickly capturing its prey as it wanders by. This prey is normally insects, usually in the form of flies and wood lice. As these scorpions are so small, they can be quite hard to find. But as I'm sure many of you know, there is a little trick to help you find them. Their exoskeletons glow under ultraviolet light, and this is the best way to spot them in their natural habitat. Although a relatively small amount of people know that this scorpion lives in the UK, they have been here for a shocking amount of time. They were thought to have arrived here in the early 19th century through a shipment of Italian masonry. Shockingly, they could deal with the English climate, and today one of their strongholds is Sheerness Dockyard in Kent. They are found along the walls of this dock, and they have called this area home for decades. Today, this is the northernmost population of scorpions outside of the Americas, and is one of the most shocking inhabitants of the UK. But for our next species, we'll be heading to the forests of South America, as we have the South American Kuwati. Now there are a few different species of Kuwati, but the ones that can be found in the UK are thought to be South American Kuwatis. These mammals are members of the raccoon family, and sometimes they are known to be as mischievous as raccoons themselves. Kuwatis can often be found in large groups, which almost exclusively consists of females and their young. 
Like their relatives the raccoons, they are also very intelligent. They feed on a wide variety of food, usually in the form of fruit invertebrates, small animals and eggs. They have many inventive ways of getting to this food, and will even resort to stealing it from humans. Although they are sometimes known for being thieves, they also play an important role in their ecosystem. When foraging, they often churn up the soil, and they use their long noses to move dirt around. This essentially aerates the soil, and helps the flow of water and nutrients. As they also feed on a large amount of fruit, they are also important seed disperses, and they also provide food for many predators in the area. Coyotes also have very long, strong tails. These tails help them balance when moving through trees, but when on the ground they can usually be seen with their tails straight up in the air, and this is thought to let other coyotes locate them when they're moving through areas of thick forest. It's unknown exactly how these coyotes got here, but there has been multiple sightings of this animal in the Lake District. This area is one of the more wilder places in the UK, and it's the perfect place for a non-native animal to go unnoticed. Some believe that these individuals escaped from zoos, but some believe that they were deliberately released. They are still only found in relatively small numbers, as a 2010 study suggested that there are only a group of 10, but this small group was thought to be breeding in the region. So although they are a very long way from home, they seem to be doing just fine. But for our next species, we'll be heading to North and East Asia, as we have the Siberian chipmunk. Now although chipmunks are mostly seen as American species, Eurasia does have its very own little striped rodent. These chipmunks can be found in a variety of habitats, but tend to prefer forested and mountainous habitats. They mostly live solitary lives, and mainly feed on a variety of seeds and nuts, as well as insects and other small animals. Historically, these chipmunks have been hunted for their fur, and they were also hated by farmers as they could damage their crop yields. Today, these animals are not hunted as frequently, and have even expanded their range. They can now be found over many countries in continental Europe, and of course there is a small population in the UK. But so far there doesn't look to be an established population. It's thought that many of these creatures are escaped pets, but there is a far stranger theory, that these chipmunks made it here from France through the Channel Tunnel. Although they are very cute, they can have a negative effect on the ecosystem, as they can compete with the native rodents, including the very rare native red squirrels. So although they're very cute, they really don't belong in the UK. But for our final species, we'll be heading to the forested areas of New Zealand, as we have the New Zealand stick insects. As I've covered many times before, New Zealand has a very unique and beautiful ecosystem. I mostly focus on the beautiful birds that can be found there, but there are also some very strange insects. New Zealand is home to the very famous wetters, but is also home to some very large stick insects. These stick insects often provide food for the birds that live there, but that's only if the birds can find them. These stick insects feed on almost any plants that they can find, and at the same time they are almost able to perfectly blend in with them. Like the scorpions, the stick insects have called the UK home for over a hundred years. They were first sighted in Paynton in 1909, and today there are thought to be over three species living here. They are mostly only found in Devon, Cornwall, and the Isles of Scilly, and so far they seem to like their new home. Southwest England can be a very pretty place, and has a much milder climate than the rest of the UK. This is the perfect climate for these stick insects, and this may be the reason that they can only be found in the southwest today. It's thought that these stick insects got to the UK through being stowaways on shipments of ferns from New Zealand. So far they have proved to be a loved addition to our ecosystem, and seem to have little to no negative impacts. And these plant shipment stowaways really have proved to be masters of disguise. If you like this video, I still think there's enough creatures to make a part 2, so let me know if you liked it in the comments down below. But thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. If you liked it, please leave a like, and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these. But until next time, goodbye.